The scariest thing that ever happened to me on Halloween was back when I was living in Liverpool for university. Halloween is always a big night for students, as is any yearly event that involves dressing up and getting absolutely wasted. But since Halloween is a really good excuse to wear considerably less clothes than usual, party-oriented students tend to get particularly excited about it. So I'm in second year at this point, living with a bunch of my student mates just off Smithton Road, which is where loads of students can get shared houses for really cheap rent. We heard that this big house party was happening just down the road from us, one of those that had its own little Facebook events page set up to keep track of invites and give people directions to the house. I remember my mates sitting around the kitchen table, all staring at the screen as they went through all the profiles of girls they said that were attending. I mean, some of them were absolutely gorgeous, so we were all definitely hyped about it. Only just a few days before Halloween, I started to feel really, really grim. I had the shakes, I was running to and from the toilet every half an hour to erupt from both ends, and I could barely keep any food down. This persisted for like 48 hours straight, and thankfully it had abated by Halloween itself, but I still felt way too rough to do any serious partying. The last thing I wanted was to end up browning myself in front of like half the girls at our uni. I mean, every lad wants to be a legend, don't they, but for the right reasons. So anyway, on the day of the house party, despite my mates insisting I make an appearance and throw together a costume, I had made the firm decision to stay at home and chill for the evening. As much as I felt like I'm missing out, I just didn't feel up to it. So about seven-ish, my mates are pre-drinking in the kitchen while I'm up in my room looking to order the spiciest curry I could get my hands on in the hopes that it would purge the rest of the sickness out of me so I could start the following week feeling fresh again. So about the time I'm burning my face off with a little chicken vindaloo, my mates are just about to head off down to the house party for a night of debauchery. There are a few final pleas for me to join them, but these are all violently rebuked. There might have been a chance of me joining them before the curry, but afterwards, no chance. I was in a full-on food coma. So a couple of hours later, I'm just chilling on the couch and wondering why British Netflix had such a dire collection of horror films when there's a knock at our front door. My first thought is that there's been some kind of puke-related disaster and one of the lads had to come back to get a change of clothes before heading back to the house party. I mean, this wasn't entirely out of the question, since the house party was only around the corner, safe staggering distance for anyone that had drank too much too quickly. But it then occurred to me that there was a chance it could have been trick-or-treaters. Smithen has a big mix of residential and student housing, so there's also a decent chance it could have been kids looking for sweets. So to save the house getting egged, I legged it into the kitchen and grabbed a few bits from the cupboards to offer any potential trick-or-treaters. But when I answered the door, Mars bars in hand, there was no one there. Maybe I'd just taken too long grabbing sweets, or maybe it was just some knock-and-run type deal. But either way, there was no one to be seen. So I just head back inside, plonk myself down on the couch and get back to digesting a ton of curry that I'd just eaten. A short while later, I'm still watching Netflix, about ready to doze off when something in the corner of the living room catches my eye. You know when you're so used to looking at a certain something that just the oddest little difference catches your eye? Well, I happened to notice that there was a little less of the orange streetlights outside coming through the little crack between the curtains and the window. Like this dark shape was outside, standing at the window. I sit up all nervous and it disappears from view, allowing me to see the orange light illuminating the street once again. Someone had been watching me. I got up, rushed to the cupboard under the stairs to grab my housemate's cricket bat, then edged toward the front door. I threw it open, ready to swing at whatever was out there, but again, there was nothing. I started to feel like I was going mental at that point, that maybe I was just exhausted from being sick for most of the week. I hadn't slept very well at all during the few days prior to Halloween, and I tried to reassure myself that maybe I was just a wee bit jumpy from being overtired. I decided it was best that I get an early night, telling myself that I'd feel much better in the morning. I did a bit of washing up, got a shower, then put on some comfy clothes to get ready for bed, but just as I do, 
there's another knock on the door. Only this time I can clearly hear some young sounding voice go trick or treat from the other side of the door. I'd almost jumped out of my skin when I heard the door go, but the voice was weirdly reassuring. I mean, it was only trick or treaters, right? The worst that could happen was I got a few eggs thrown at me or some toilet paper lashed over the house. I walked downstairs, grabbed the handful of Mars bars I'd fished out of the cupboard, then opened up the front door. I was expecting to see a gaggle of school-aged kids, maybe accompanied by an adult supervising them, but there was just one smallish-looking figure stood in the pathway of our shared house. They couldn't have been any older than a teenager, but they definitely looked a little bit too old to be trick-or-treating. I don't imagine that they'd been particularly intimidating otherwise, but the mask they were wearing seriously gave me the creeps. It looked old, like it smelled like disgusting unwashed latex on the inside. I'm not even sure it was meant to be a Halloween mask at all. It was like an old man's face with these tiny black eyes and a big white smile stretching from ear to ear. I made some derisive comment to him like, aren't you a bit too old to be trick-or-treating? But held the handful of Mars bars out towards him anyway. I reckoned he'd just tell me to bugger off and snatch the sweets off me and leg it down the path. But he didn't. The lad just stood there, looking at me from behind the mask, not even moving to take the chocolate bars off me. I asked him if he was alright, starting to actually get creeped out by his behavior on top of the weird old mask he was wearing. But still, he didn't say anything. There was something intensely creepy about not being able to see his actual eyes behind that mask, and the longer we stood there in silence, just staring at each other, the more I felt myself begin to tense up. Then right as I'm about to just give him an awkward goodbye and shut the door, I hear a loud noise coming from behind me. I didn't really think the situation through, I just reacted, running into the kitchen at the back of the house where the noise was coming from, just in time to see someone smash the back door open. About three or four people then pour into the kitchen, all wearing masks, some armed with bats, others with these big knives in their hands. I turn around and leg it back towards the front door, planning on running upstairs to my room where my phone was charging to bring the police. But to my absolute horror, blocking the way to the stairs was the little lad with the mask on. Only this time, he had a knife in his hand too. He'd been in on this whole thing that whole time, and as he pointed the knife in my direction, all I could do was raise my hands in this please-don't-stab-me type of way. Get on the floor, he said, in this voice that seriously sounded like he was no older than about 14. Like he legit sounded like a kid, and that scared me even more. A grown man might have the presence of mind to not hurt anyone and keep the severity of their crimes to a minimum, but a kid... I thought he might just stab me up for the fun of it. I'd heard stories about gangs all over the world making younger kids commit violence to just sort of prove themselves, and that's what had me shaking as I lay down on the carpeted floor in the hallway, face down with my hands on the back of my head. I listened as the gang just completely ransacked the house. I couldn't see exactly what they were taking, but I heard them mentioning laptops and phones a fair bit laughing to themselves as they absolutely raided each and every room in the house. At some points I heard smashing and crashing noises as they just took it upon themselves to commit as much wanton destruction as they liked, giggling maniacally to each other as they realized they had the time and freedom to do pretty much whatever they fancied. I thought if I just lay there, keeping still and quiet, that they'd leave me alone. But that was just wishful thinking on my part. Obviously, they had to make their way through the hallway a fair few times, and when they did, they'd either literally walk all over me, which was painful enough, or they'd get in a few kicks here and there just to hear me grimace. I think the worst part of the physical abuse was when I heard one of them say, Kick him in the balls, lad, to one of their mates. I tried to shut my legs, but they still aimed a few kicks between my thighs. Luckily, I was kind of tucked up, if you know what I mean, and there wasn't anything too delicate exposed, but still, the idea of getting my bollocks crushed under the trainer of some disgusting little thug had my heart practically jumping out of my throat. It sort of reminded me of that scene from A Clockwork Orange. They were there to rob us, 
That was bloody obvious, but they clearly took a great deal of joy in just being able to terrorize someone for a bit, and they seemed to get a real kick out of realizing that I wasn't from Liverpool. At some point, I said something like, Just take what you want. Please don't hurt me. And they burst out laughing. I wouldn't say I'm posh by any stretch of the imagination, but I'd definitely say I'm well more spoken than your average scouser. They started mimicking me in these little voices, stamping on my head and kicking me. I just lay there, wishing I'd never said anything. After what seemed like forever, listening to those kids ferrying out belongings into the alley behind the house, they finally left. But not before putting one of their knives to my throat and telling me that they'd be back to cut my head off if they so much as even saw a police officer in the area. Then as quickly as they'd all appeared, they just ghosted. I waited for a long time before I found it in me to stand up, and as I tried, my knees were way shakier than I'd care to admit. I went from room to room surveying the destruction. The place was a mess, but the thing that amazed and gutted me more than anything else was the sheer amount of stuff they'd taken. God knows how they'd got it all away from the house, but they'd taken the TVs, our game consoles, audio equipment, pretty much anything electrical that wasn't nailed down. It also looked like they'd taken pretty much all our trainers and had raided our closets for any clothes that took their liking. I wanted to call the police, really did, but with what phone? I'm almost glad I got a few kicks to the head, otherwise the sense of shame and humiliation might have been too much to bear. I ended up knocking at my neighbor's houses, but unlike me, they were way too smart to answer their doors to strangers on Halloween. It was probably the single worst experience of my life up to that point. I had to just go back inside the house and sit there in the living room couch with my head in my hands, just trying not to hold back tears. It was hours before any of my drunken housemates arrived back. Before that, I think I just sort of sat there at the kitchen table in the one room that hadn't been completely ransacked, just drinking a few tins of lager, feeling absolutely shell-shocked, until finally two of them who hadn't polled returned home. And that's about the end of it. There's no real resolution to this story. The police couldn't do anything other than take down a list of what had been stolen in the hopes that any of the laptops turned up in pawn shops, but we never heard back about anything involving that. It was weird in that house for a long while after. I used to think the other lads blamed me for what happened for not defending the house property, but I realized that was just the trauma from that night making me doubt myself. I had nightmares for a while, a long while actually, and in the end my parents paid for a few counseling sessions to help me get through my skull that what happened that night really wasn't my fault, how it could have happened to anyone. I got past it in time, but to this day, it remains the single most terrifying event of my entire life. I grew up in rural Iowa, the kind of place where it's just cornfields for miles and miles around. It was a pretty terrible place to grow up, like it'll always be home to me and I always have a fair amount of affection for it. Home is where the heart is and all that nonsense, but even from the earliest age I can remember, I couldn't wait to leave. Like, put it this way, Halloween has always been my favorite holiday, but unlike the kids who trick-or-treat over in Cedar Rapids or Waterloo, who had actual neighborhoods to harvest whole sacks of candy from, we'd have to walk like a mile and a half at a time just to make it to the next house. So aside from the one year where our mom drove us over to Dyersville so we could actually get a taste of how those city kids lived, trick-or-treating just wasn't really an option for us. So a little backstory here. The last year we were allowed to go trick-or-treating, our immediate neighbor to the east who lived like three miles away basically told us to buzz off because we were getting way too big to be playing kids' games. This guy has begrudgingly given us a few apples some years and we always sort of resented him for it. But that year, when he told us where to go, it made us downright hate him. I mean, for the entirety of the next year, me and my brother would scowl whenever my dad drove us past his house. To us, 
he ruined the one good thing we got to do around Halloween each year. I know we were just dumb kids, but kids are also cruel and stubborn on occasion, and I guess we were just that kind of kid. So the next year, my mom decides to take us over to Living History Farms over in Urbandale. Living History Farms is this place over near Des Moines that bills itself as interactive outdoor museum which teaches people about Midwestern rural life experiences. Obviously, we weren't thrilled about the visit. It wasn't exactly exciting for two boys in their early teens. I mean, learning about some of the origins of Halloween was pretty cool. I mean, a kid like me was all about hearing how Halloween was the night when spirits of the dead returned to earth to wreak havoc on those that had wronged them in life. However, there was one particular little educational tidbit that got me and my brother's attention, and that was the stories of how our Iowan ancestors used Halloween as a night to play all kinds of pranks on each other. Pulling up cabbages and shrubs out of the garden was a common trick. Wagons were pushed into the lane or the street, or if the kids were feeling ambitious, they'd hoist the cars up on top of the victim's barn roof. But the most common mischief was taking your neighbor's garden or barnyard gates off the hinges and leaving it in someone else's yard. I remember the teacher lady telling us this, then me and my brother just looking at each other with this wordless kind of communication like, oh, the neighbor is going to get it this year. So that year, we snuck out of the house in the early hours of the morning, walked down to the neighbor's place with a screwdriver and hammer, and then did exactly that. We took his front gate off the hinges, walked it like a mile down the road to his other neighbor's place, then left it in the front yard. We did stuff like that for the next couple of years, each time getting progressively more bold, screwing with him harder and harder until it got to the point that we struggled to top the previous year's prank. Like it got to the point where we stole a huge section of his white picket fence and just threw it into the cornfield across the highway. I mean, we put some actual work into that, dismantling it piece by piece so as not to make too much noise and wake the guy. I mean, it sucked that we never got to hang around to see his reaction, but I guess imagining him going outside in the morning and going insane with rage was enough to keep us amused. So this one year, we rocked up to his house in the middle of the night and saw something we'd never expected to see in a million years. The neighbor guy obviously hated Halloween and never ever put up any decorations or anything. But that year, we turned up to see this Grim Reaper figure on his porch. It wasn't just some dumb-looking scarecrow type thing either. It seemed like the guy had put in a lot of work getting hold of an actual mannequin of something, as well as all this spooky-looking black robe stuff to dress it in. But since he was a farmer, he didn't have much trouble getting hold of the old rusty scythe that was leaning up against it. I mean, yeah, it was kind of intimidating... He'd obviously only put it there to try to scare us off, but we weren't about to be put off from our little year ritual at this point. Nothing short of a tornado could deter us from getting our revenge for having been so mean to us that Halloween night. But right as we started to dismantle his fence in almost absolute silence, I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. Or rather, I noticed the lack of something so subtle that it actually takes me a minute to realize what I wasn't looking at. At some point, as we were taking his fence apart, the Grim Reaper statue thing had just up and disappeared. I stopped what I'm doing, looking around the front yard and trying to spot where it could have gone. I whisper over to my brother like, The Reaper's gone. Did you see it move? And at first he looked at me like I'm crazy. But then he too starts getting pretty freaked out. We're just crouched down, tools in hand, in the dead silence of the night, realizing that we'd been a little bit overconfident in our yearly pranks. I mean, we didn't quite realize what was happening at the time, only that things were about to go horribly wrong for us. Let's get out of here, my brother whispered, and we immediately get up and start sort of jogging back towards the highway. Then, out of nowhere, the Grim Reaper is just standing there in front of us, with that big old rusty scythe in his hand, blocking our escape. It hadn't been a mannequin that was set up on the neighbor guy's porch. It was actually him. He dressed up like some dumb decoration and just stood there, still as a statue, waiting for the pranksters to arrive. 
There was like one drawn out moment where we just sort of locked eyes with the guy who had taken down the hood of the black robes he was wearing, and then we just bolted. But since he was blocking the way to the road out front, we had to run back through his property, climbing over a fence and into a cornfield to get away from him. He was really fast for an older guy too. Like maybe it was just all that anger from having been victimized year after year, but somehow he wasn't weighed down by that scythe and those robes, which for some reason he'd opted to keep on, didn't slow him down either. I was scared, sure, but I figured we'd be able to get away, but remember how I said we had to scale a fence to get away? Well, jumping down the other side didn't go too well for me, and I badly sprained my ankle when I landed. That was when I really got terrified, when I realized I couldn't actually get away from the guy. My brother just kept running, and I wanted to shout after him to help me, but I knew the shout would give away my position to the guy, so I just kept my mouth shut. So picture the scene. I'm hiding out in the cornfield, so scared that I'm actually covering my mouth to keep from breathing too heavy, while this furious, scythe-armed guy is stalking up and down the rows looking for me. So every so often, I had to just sort of limp to a hiding spot further away from him, trying my best not to rustle any of the stock so I wouldn't betray my hiding spot. I mean, thank God it was the middle of the night, and maybe the guy's eyesight or hearing was just failing him in general, but I managed not to get myself caught. I just kept on stumbling further and further away until he just gave up and headed back to his house. But Jesus Christ, it was completely and utterly terrifying hearing him say all this stuff like, I'm going to cut you up into little pieces and feed you to my pigs. Like the voice of his was telling me he meant every word of what he said. So yeah, as you can imagine, I was pretty close to peeing my pants, knowing that I just couldn't get away fast enough. Needless to say, we didn't try any more pranks on that guy after that. I made up some excuse to my parents as to how I'd hurt my ankle and then just to use it as an excuse to stay home until it had healed, given that I was super paranoid about the neighbor guy figuring out who exactly had been victimizing him year after year. But yeah, that's my story. I know it's probably not the scariest thing you'd ever heard, and I know that we kind of deserve what we got in the end. So I had a pretty weird childhood growing up down in Florida. My parents weren't always present, I mean, they weren't bad parents by any stretch of the imagination, they always provided for me and my sister, but let's just say they weren't always the most attentive because of their respective work schedules. I could do pretty much whatever I wanted to, whenever I wanted to, which, as you can imagine, wasn't exactly good for me. And one of the things I'd do which definitely messed me up a bit as a child was staying up all hours watching late night TV until I passed out on the couch. Like I love those times. I got to see all these messed up movies and stuff way before any of my friends got to. But it was staying up late like that which allowed me to see something even more screwed up than any horror movie or Cinemax flick. It's Halloween night, of all the nights for this to happen, and I'm lying on the couch in the TV room after a night of successful trick-or-treating with a few school friends. I'm just sort of drifting off while watching Nightmare on Elm Street, only really awake from the stomach ache of eating way too much Halloween candy, when I hear a noise coming from the porch. I instantly recognize it was the sound of an old school porch swing rocking back and forth, like this telltale metal creaking noise that I'm sure you can all imagine pretty well. My mom and dad are doing their weird grown up things upstairs which turned out years later that they were a husband and wife team of drug dealers, and my sister is in bed upstairs. So as soon as I realize whoever is out there is actually some complete stranger, I start getting pretty creeped out. But as much as I was pretty scared, I absolutely could not resist the urge to see who it was. I had to know. Even when I was that age, I was super protective of my little sister. So I find myself just slowly creeping on my tiptoes over towards the big bay windows of the TV room and peeking around the curtains to see out into the porch. It's pretty dark outside and we didn't have a security light back then, so I could only use the glow of the street lights outside to actually make out who was out there on the porch. 
but I'll never forget what I saw when my eyes finally adjusted after having been staring at a bright TV in a dark room for so long. Sitting there, rocking back and forth on our porch swing, is this middle-aged looking woman. She looked about as old as my grandma at the time, so maybe 50 to 60, wearing nothing but some old nightdress type thing. In her hand was something I didn't quite recognize at first because of what it was covered in. If I could have seen the blade shining in the low light, I'd have known it was a knife right away. But because it was still dripping with what I could only assume was blood, that actually looked kind of black in the orange street light, it took me a minute to realize exactly the kind of horror that I was facing. When I finally did, I immediately just freak out and bolt upstairs to my parents' room. They did that weird thing that they always did when I burst into their room unannounced, closing various drawers or boxes, hiding things they didn't want me to see. They were angry, as usual, asking me impatiently what I was thinking just walking into their room like that. Usually it was for me to tell them I needed food or whatever they neglected to do, but this time I was just too terrified to actually get the words out. Like I'd said, they were annoyed at first, but when they realized just how upset I was, they actually took me seriously for once. Maybe they thought it was the cops or something outside. I guess they were right to be paranoid about that sort of thing. But when I actually told them what I'd seen, they lost all sympathy. I remember my dad telling me that it was just a bad dream from all the dumb movies I watched, like that wasn't mostly their fault, and all the Halloween candy I'd eaten, and that I should grow up and go back to bed. But I just kept on crying and begging him to go look, insisting that what I'd seen was actually real, and not just some figment of my childish, horror-saturated imagination. He tried to push me out of the room so that they could carry on with whatever illegal nonsense that they were doing in there, but when I pretty much just clung on to him and screamed my little head off, he finally snapped. He dragged me downstairs by the arm, so hard I almost fell down the entire flight of stairs, then into the TV room and over to the front door, apparently just to prove that there was nothing actually there. But as you can imagine, this only made me worse. He was pulling me towards the single most terrifying image I'd ever seen at that point in my life. Way more terrifying than just some dumb horror movie, because what I'd seen was actually real life, and even though I was young, that was painfully clear to me. We reached the front door. He swings it open and drags me outside, cursing under his breath the whole time. Then he like points in the direction of the porch without even really looking himself and says, See? There's nothing there at all. Just your fri- Then he stops, because he actually sees what I've been talking about. I never saw a look like that on his face ever again. One of pure shock and terror that his kid had actually been telling the truth about something so utterly horrific. It was only then that I actually got a really good look at the woman instead of seeing the bloody knife in her grip. She was ashen-faced, like she was completely traumatized by something. Her hair was up in rollers, and the nightdress or nightgown or whatever she was wearing was absolutely soaked in blood. She turned towards us, and there was just nothing behind her eyes. They were wide, these big white and brown circles just sunken into her head, but there was nothing in them like she had no soul to speak of whatsoever. Then she stood up, that bloody knife in her grip, and said the words I'll never forget as long as I live. I killed him. I had to. I couldn't take it anymore. So I killed him. My dad just pulls me inside the house, even more violently than he dragged me out of it, then slams the door and runs to grab his gun from the upstairs bedroom. For years I wonder why I didn't just call the cops, but I suppose that's something else that's painfully clear at this point. I watch from the hallway, peeking out as he goes back outside and points the gun at her, telling him to get off the porch as the cops were on their way. This was a lie, obviously, but it was enough to get her to leave. She didn't even run, though. She just sort of stood up, all slow, and then wandered off into the night as I watched her from a crack in the TV room curtains, same spot I'd spied her from the first time. It was only like ten years later that I actually found out what the deal was. Apparently the him she was referring to was her abusive husband, 
who'd been beating on her so much that she'd gotten sick of it and decided to finally defend herself, albeit in a pretty permanent way. She'd finally gotten picked up by the cops later that night when she tried to break into one of our neighbor's houses, and as far as I know, she's still in prison for what she did. I also wondered why my parents were so keen to get rid of the porch swing that day and why they lied to the cops when they called, telling her they hadn't seen the woman even though they had. I guess they just didn't want anyone snooping around the house asking questions or picking up any suspicious smells that might lead to some kind of DEA raid or whatever. Nothing really changed after that though. My parents didn't get any better at being actual parents. I just didn't stay up late anymore. Because I never wanted to be the one to discover anything like that ever again. My family has lived out here in rural Nebraska since they emigrated from Bohemia, located in the modern-day Czech Republic, in the middle of the 19th century. Apparently, they were part of some weird, obscure Christian sect, one that was heavily persecuted in their native Bohemia. So they took a ship to Ellis Island and lived in New York City until they were basically chased out of there too, hence why they ended up in rural Nebraska. They started a farm here, worked the land and actually became relatively wealthy for the time whilst keeping themselves to themselves. According to a family story which my grandpa insists is 100% true, it was the middle of October when my great-great-grandma comes down with some horrible disease. The family did everything they could to keep her comfortable, riding their horses for miles and miles to fetch her medicine which actually brought her back from the brink a few times. But eventually... Right when they thought she might actually be okay, her condition deteriorated rapidly and she passed away one night, just after midnight. Now, this would have been a sad occasion under any circumstances, but the date of her passing was of particular relevance to my family. You see, she died just after midnight on the 31st of October on Halloween. Like I said, my family were members of a particularly strange sect of Eastern European Christians, ones that like many, believe that Halloween was a time when the spirits of the dead were particularly active. Only they believe that if a person died on Halloween, that it was possible for these long dead spirits to enter the corpse of the person recently deceased, to take over their body and resurrect it in order to perform acts of evil. To prevent this, they had to perform a series of rituals very quickly before burying the dead person as soon as possible in order to prevent the evil spirits from taking hold in the person's body. So according to Grandpa's story, they washed my great-great-grandma's body with ointment, burned sage to shoo away spirits, then buried her in the family cemetery located in a secluded patch of their farmland. Now apparently, my great-great-grandma had these two big dogs that absolutely adored her. Naturally, they were completely devastated when she'd passed on and stayed by her body for the longest time. When she was buried, they refused to leave her gravesite and no matter how much meat or animal bones they were offered by my family, they refused to come inside the old farmhouse. They thought this would just happen for a day or two until they realized the permanence of the loss and just got too cold or hungry and decided to return indoors. But night after night they slept by the grave only eating or drinking water if it was brought over to them, and even then they seemed to do so reluctantly. Then, about a week and a half after she was buried, well into the month of November, they began to bark and scratch at the earth atop the grave. They would howl all night long, and the attempts at digging got so bad that eventually a long-dead uncle of mine had to go out there and drag each of the dogs inside in order to keep them from straight up digging up the grave. But even when they were locked inside... The dogs would bark and howl in the direction of the cemetery, which obviously caused the family a huge amount of distress. The grief was bad enough without the weird behavior of the dogs, but as much as they tried to quiet the animals, the dogs just would not cease their barking and howling. Apparently, it was close to driving the family half insane by the time they tried to do anything about it. They had even discussed killing the dogs just so they could get some real sleep at night. Before they took any such drastic action, they decided to check out the grave in order to make sure nothing was amiss with the burial. It was thought that maybe rats might have burrowed their way into the grave, 
chewed through the wood of the coffin and were gnawing on my great-great-grandma's rotting flesh, which obviously the dogs will have been able to hear or at least smell given their more powerful senses of perception. But after hours of work digging through the frozen soil, they reached my great-great-grandma's casket and found that there was no damage to the wood and it was all perfectly intact. But still, the dogs kept on barking. They ran out to the grave site and began barking into the open grave, so the family decided to properly exhume her to make sure nothing was amiss. What they found was absolutely horrifying. Instead of the peaceful look on my great-great-grandma's face, the one she was buried with, she had wide, dead, terrified eyes, and her jaw was wide open in what appeared to be a death scream. Huge chunks of her hair had been torn out from her scalp, presumably by her own hands, lying in patches of steel gray around her rotting head. Not only that, but her fingers were bloody and mangled, the fingernails lying around the wooden box where they'd been torn off by incessant scratching on the coffin lid, which itself bore the damage from her efforts. The sight drove her still-living husband to madness. He ran screaming from the gravesite and was never the same again. And when he realized exactly what had happened that Halloween night, he hung himself from a rafter in the barn. And he did so because he realized, despite the lack of medical knowledge possessed by the family, that my great-great-grandma hadn't been quite dead when they had buried her that night. In fact, she had merely slipped into a comatose state one which was mistaken for death by the family that was so lacking in accurate medical knowledge. And so, when she was unconscious and presumed dead, they'd taken her out to the cemetery that day and buried her alive. The dogs were barking and howling not because they could hear rats, but because they could hear my great-great-grandma's screams for help. They could hear her ripping her own nails out from clawing at the wood of her own coffin, and it drove them to an absolute panic. That's why they barked and howled at night, because they knew their beloved owner was suffering so much. I'm not sure how true this whole story is, to be honest, but I also can't think of a reason why such a tall tale might even exist in our family. Surely a person might want to hide something like that from the world forever, but maybe it's retold so often because they never, ever want it to happen again, for any reason, because the results of their poor judgment were so traumatic that it almost destroyed an entire family, one that had already survived such hideous persecution on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. But I know it's a story that, once a year, around Halloween, the elders of our family tell to the oldest of the children, so that they might tell the tale in time, to ensure that no matter what happens, the family never faces such a mind-shattering horror as long as it might exist. My mom married her boyfriend of a few years about five years ago now. It wasn't one of those weird, awkward affairs, though. I was genuinely happy for her. You see, my dad passed away from brain cancer way back when I was 12, so she had been a widow for over 12 years, and I know just how lonely she'd been in that time. Her new relationship with this guy was a huge whirlwind for years, with them meeting, dating, breaking up, dating again before eventually getting married. My mom felt like she was betraying dad's memories at times and she didn't make it easy on the new guy. But he stuck with her, even when she was having rough patches and I gotta admit that really won me over when I realized just how much he loved her. She spoke once about him having experienced some loss in his life too and how that experience had united them, given them a shared experience to bond over. As I said, I liked him and I didn't know much about his personal life or his background but my mom was happy enough, so I really did approve of the whole thing. After she married him, she ended up packing her bags and moving into this big old house of his up in Scotland. Turns out he had a lot of money from playing the stock market and actually offered to pay the rent on the apartment me and mom used to share, which, as you can imagine, didn't get an iota of complaint out of me or my boyfriend, who ended up moving in to take her place when she'd moved out. A few months went by before we got an invite to come up to stay with them. I thought we might be able to all get together for Christmas, but as it happens, Mum and the new guy were off to winter in the Maldives at a place he owned, 
and wouldn't be around until the following February. So, we worked all around our respective commitments and the only time we'd all be available to get together happened to be one particular few days, the days surrounding the 31st of October, Halloween. As it turns out, Mum's new home was really out of the way. It was an absolute pain to get to. We had to get three trains, as well as a taxi that cost us an arm and a leg. But honestly, when we finally got there, it was worth the journey. It was absolutely gorgeous. Seriously, like something out of a Downton Abbey. The estate, as the new guy referred to it, sat on a few hundred acres of beautiful rolling Scottish hillside and was just about the most picturesque place I'd ever laid eyes on. I'll admit that I was extremely nervous about getting to know Stephen, my mum's new husband, but I really was for trying my best to form some kind of bond with him. I knew how much it had mean to my mum, and I really mean it when I'd say I'd do absolutely anything to make her happy. That, and it was my first chance at any kind of holiday in years, so I was determined to make the most of it. However, it definitely wasn't easy. Not that he wasn't the perfect gentleman, he made every effort to make me and my boyfriend feel welcome there, and made a point of showing me exactly how happy he could make my mom. He didn't try and play at being my stepdad, he wasn't overbearing, he was exactly the kind of guy we needed him to be, and for that I'll always be extremely grateful. But over the course of our first day on the estate, I began to feel more and more troubled for some reason. I couldn't quite put my finger on what it was, and my boyfriend actually suggested that maybe staying in something that looked like your stereotypical haunted house over Halloween probably wasn't helping. But I promise you, it wasn't that. I'm quite the horror movie fanatic, as well as being a dyed-in-the-wool skeptic, and I'm definitely not one to start sensing auras or any of that nonsense. But like I said, something just didn't sit right with me about that place, and... No matter how hard Stephen tried to make us feel at home, I still couldn't quite shake this oppressive feeling. I finally chalk it up to me being more upset about my mom getting remarried than I was willing to admit to myself. So, still willing to make the effort, I found myself wandering around the grounds of the estate, dragging my boyfriend in tow. Because being inside the old manor house just made me feel worse and worse with each passing minute, and the last thing I wanted was for my mom to assume that I had taken the hump with Stephen for whatever reason. God forbid that I was jealous or like resented the fact that he came from old money or something because I can assure you, I'm not that kind of person. On that first night at the estate, me and my boyfriend took a bath together in this massive porcelain tub that sat in the ensuite guest bathroom. We were sitting there, soaking up the hot water that was infused with this super fancy molten brown bath oil stuff, engaged in some inconsequential conversation when he stopped mid-sentence and put a hand on my shoulder. He asked me what I'd done to my back. I was like, what are you talking about? As far as I knew, I hadn't done anything to my back at all. He then told me I had this massive purple bruise on my back. I reached back to feel where he was talking about and... He was right. I felt this dull pain when I pressed down on the skin of my shoulder blade. There was actually this big bloody bruise there. I jumped out of the bath and walked over to this big fancy mirror to have a look at it and dear god, it was massive. I put it down to the strap of one of our bags digging into my shoulder as I was carrying it but honestly, I knew full well that there was no way it could have done anything like that. I tried not to get too freaked out but I'll be honest. I was really quiet for the rest of the night, right up until me and the boyfriend got into bed together to get some well-deserved rest, but that night I hardly slept. You see, the guest bedroom looked out over this big empty field on the estate. I had no idea at the time, but something about that big dark field was really, really bothering me, even when I couldn't see it from where I was lying. At one point, I got up during the middle of the night and just wandered over to the window staring out into the darkness, not even sure what I was looking for. I was only able to actually get any bloody sleep once I'd worked out how to draw the big old curtains. The curtain rail must have been a hundred years old, so it took some doing. But with the help of my boyfriend, we did manage to close them, and only then could I actually get my head down. I honestly thought that I'd start feeling better the following day, but when I woke up the next morning... 
Halloween morning to be exact, I was in floods of tears. I didn't actually wake up on my own. It was my boyfriend that shook me awake, telling me that I was whimpering and crying in my sleep. He was really shaken up himself, telling me that I'd scared the life out of him and asking if I'd had some kind of nightmare. I couldn't remember any bad dreams at all, but I still felt grim, and in my panicked state, I told him that I thought that we should just get out of there. He tried to calm me down, telling me it was probably just the angst of seeing my mom with someone else bubbling to the surface, but I flipped on him, telling him yet again that it wasn't anything to do with that, how something was badly wrong with that house, even though I just couldn't exactly work out what it was. My boyfriend insisted that we should stay another day, just to see if things would get any easier for me, but I flat out refused, telling him we needed to make up an excuse as to why we needed to leave so I wouldn't upset mom. So being the good boyfriend that he is, he manufactured some excuse that he had a family emergency back home, and that I'd have to come with him for emotional support. He even said he could bear the brunt of my mom being annoyed with him, and God, if ever there was a time I knew I loved him, it was then. As soon as we were in the taxi and on the way back to the train station, I felt like a bloody great weight had been lifted from my shoulders. I still felt proper weird for a day or two, but I think that was just knowing my mom was up in that house. Even if it was with Stephen, who I honestly still adore to this day, it just didn't feel right up there, and I just couldn't quite relax knowing she was there. A few weeks later, Stephen and Mum are back down in London where Stephen was based as part of his job running a company. I was made up that they were out of that big old house, but Mum insisted on making plans for us to go up there as a family again at some point. It was only then that I just came out and told her no, that I hated it up there, how I really felt horribly uneasy and that, although I didn't know why, that I knew that there was something horribly wrong with that place. I told her all about the big weird bruise on my back, how I woke up crying that morning, the feeling of the big dark field, the works. I hadn't even finished speaking when she turned deathly pale. Then it all came out. She'd been feeling the exact same way. The whole time she was up there, she just didn't want to let on. She thought a bit of family time up there might do the trick, but it just hadn't. It hadn't fixed a bloody thing. She hadn't felt right about the place ever since she learned what had happened to Stephen's ex-wife. You see, remember I told you that Stephen had suffered a significant loss himself at one point? Well, it turns out that he too had lost a spouse, only not to some slow, painful disease like cancer. Stephen's wife had been suffering from severe postnatal depression ever since they had their third child. The family doctor had tried everything they could to help her, but nothing worked and one day she had gone into the hunting shed around the back of the house, loaded up a shotgun, walked into a field, and blown her own head off. I had so many questions, but I remember only asking one at first. I asked her which field Stephen's wife had shot herself in. My mum looked at the carpet as she answered, the one just outside, the guest bedroom. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official and give and receive feedback from the community and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, strangers don't always have the best candy.